Hi, I'm David Colosso. I'm a graduate student here at the Department of History and Philosophy of Science at the University of Pittsburgh. Now, in collaboration with the Hillman Library and the Center for Philosophy of Science, we'll be looking at some of the interesting artifacts in the Archives of Scientific Philosophy. Let's go to the archives. Today I'll be meeting with History and Philosophy of Science graduate student Jennifer White to talk about Robert Boyle and his experiments on flame and air. Jennifer White, thank you for joining us today. Uh, can you tell us something about your work and, and how it relates to this uh, interesting work here by Boyle? Hi, I'm Jennifer. I'm a graduate student here at Pitt in the Department of History and Philosophy of Science. Um, I mainly work on thought experiments and scientific representation, but I also have a strong historical interest in early modern science, in particular uh, figures like Robert Boyle, the author of this work. So uh, can you tell me a little bit about this work and, and you know, how the archives came to acquire it? So this work is a collection of um, short works by Boyle. Most of them are experimental tracts about uh, the relationship between fire and air. Um, but there's also a long hydrostatical discourse, uh, which is a response to a dispute Boyle was in with the philosopher Henry Moore. It was published in uh, 1672 by Henry Oldenburg, um, the secretary of the Royal Society and everybody's correspondent. Um, uh, it came to uh, this library in late 2018 as part of a program to expand the list of primary texts available for humanities students. Yeah, and that's uh, something that's really great here about the university library system is, is, is you know, the priority in getting these kinds of works available to, uh, to the intellectually curious and the thinkers here at the university. But uh, you know, getting back to Boyle, you know, who, who was Robert Boyle and, and what, was he, you know, what was he after? So you remember high school chemistry? Uh, yes, sure. Uh, if you remember high school chemistry, you might remember Robert Boyle best from that. He's the namesake of what's now known as Boyle's Law, um, about the relationship between the qualities of gases. He's sometimes called the father of modern chemistry, too. Though he didn't just work on chemistry. He also uh, wrote a lot about philosophy. He wrote a lot about theology, ethics, even alchemy, though he didn't write about that so much uh, in the open. Sure. Uh, he lived between uh, 1627 and 1691. He was born in Ireland uh, and was the son of the Earl of uh, Cork. Cork. Um, which meant he was fantastically wealthy his whole life. He could, uh, could spend his time uh, writing works like this. He's one of the founding members of the Royal Society, too, and one of its most prolific early authors. All right, yeah, so when, you know, when I think of Boyle and what I've read by Boyle and about Boyle, I think major innovator of scientific experiment. And Maybe you could tell us something about how this work kind of illustrates the experimental aims that Boyle has, as well as maybe his methods. You know, what's he trying to prove here? So the subject of this book is uh, the relationship between flame and air. And flame in this context means not only uh, flame as in fire, um, or flame as in explosion, but also the flamma vitalis, the flame of life, uh, which was hypothesized to explain why animals need to breathe. Uh, so this... Uh, set of experiments, Boyle is doing a number of tests in the air pump, uh, a device constructed by, for him by Robert Hooke, which was able to produce a fairly uh, good vacuum. Uh, it was one of the first devices in the world that was able to do this. Um, so in this uh, work, Boyle tests whether you can kindle fires in a vacuum, whether you can spark explosions with gunpowder, with chemicals, um, whether you can uh, uh, whether animals can live in the vacuum, whether glowworms will still glow. Um, you can't light a fire, but maybe the glowworms can figure it out, but they can't. Um, it's really a remarkable collection of work. Um, he's, uh, he's got this technology and he's using it for anything you can think of. But the, the most interesting thing about what this work says about Boyle's method is that um, alongside the descriptions of uh, the results of Boyle's experiments are long descriptions of the methods he used to produce them. Um, he gives you enough instructions that if you had an air pump at home, you could replicate these experiments in your own time. Um, he, he even goes so far as to provide safety instructions for how to uh, handle particularly the experiments concerning explosions. Uh, one must be careful with gunpowder. Um, there's an amusing anecdote um, part of the way through uh, in which Boyle uh, recounts how an uh, incautious assistant of his 
didn't listen closely enough to the instructions he gave and ended up producing a chemical explosion so strong it blew off his own hat. Of course, though, uh, the air pump is a monstrously expensive and difficult to operate instrument. Um, he didn't really expect you to have one at home. Okay, so that, that sounds like, the, how is it the case, you know, so he's giving you the instructions to use this device that I don't have and, and no one at the time, or very, very few people at the time would have had. So why give the instructions at all? So the instructions are important because uh, even though uh, he doesn't expect everybody to be able to produce the phenomena on their own, he wanted the phenomena the uh, air pump produced to be public knowledge. He wanted it to be publicly accessible. So he, he accomplished this both by staging public demonstrations of what the air pump could do, including of experiments like these, and uh, by describing um, the describing the phenomena of the experiments in sufficient detail as to uh, really allow the reader to imagine themselves present at such a demonstration. Uh, these demonstrations were fairly popular and they continued until long after Boyle's death, but uh, he knew that not everyone would be able to get to one. Uh, so he, he writes in enough detail that you don't actually have to be there to imagine that you were there. So I, you know, I think about modern and maybe even past hundred years of scientific experimental reporting, and I, you, know, you read it, and you get the results, you get the report, but I don't think of it as trying to get you to imagine being there. Why is that so important to Boyle? So it's particularly important to Boyle because of the nature of these experiments. Um, Boyle is experimenting in a vacuum, and vacuums uh, are not something that you will just ever, you'll just experience in your everyday life. You can't simply walk out into nature and see one, at least not on a scale that you can manipulate. Um, indeed, there's a line of philosophy stemming from Aristotle, but going all the way up until uh, René Descartes and his followers, who were contemporaries of Boyle's, uh, that, uh, that a vacuum, a space without any matter in it, is in principle impossible. So Boyle has something to prove here. He has to prove not only that the phenomena he sees in the vacuum can obtain, but also that the uh, vacuum is a possible phenomenon to begin with. Uh, and that's why he, he goes through such trouble to present these lucid descriptions of what it is like to see these experiments unfold. That really strikes me as an interesting and, and important difference then between kind of the experiments of Boyle's day and the kind of scientific experimentation that we have now. I think it is an important difference. Um, Boyle and other members of the Royal Society are often referred to as the early progenitors of our modern experimental method. Um, and indeed, they, our modern experimental method does draw a lot on the Royal Society and its journal, which was the first scientific journal. Um, but what Boyle is doing here has to be different because when Boyle is doing it, it is new. Um, Boyle's experimental reporting uh, doesn't just uh, show you new phenomena, it shows you new methods. For instance, um, Boyle is, show, is describing the relationship between flame and air. Um, and he decides to do this by produce, attempting to produce flame in a situation where there is no air, which is a very different kind of approach than you might expect. You could uh, think that the best way to investigate the relationship between flame and air is to go find some flame where there is air. Um, and Boyle is showing us that you can learn more by taking the air away and seeing what remains. That's a feature that our modern experimental method has in spades, but that was very new in Boyle's time. What he's doing in these, uh, these uh, experimental reports is simultaneously convincing you of the phenomenon he's describing and also of the efficacy of the method he's using to find it. So, yeah, thanks. That's really interesting. And, um, I, you know, one last thing to point out. What's going on with this title? Oh, you mean the, the full title of the work? It's, it's easy. It's easy. It's just uh, the new experiments touching on the relation between flame and air and about explosions, a hydrostatical discourse occasioned by some objections of Dr. Henry Moore against some explications of new experiments made by the author of these tracts, to which is annexed a hydrostatical letter elucidating an experiment about the way of weighing water in water. I don't see what's so wrong with that. Well, elucidations. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.